<laughs> Bess has got something going on. Yeah. Fortunately, there was only one woman around with an American accent. This is in Africa, so they were like, oh, that's good luck. You guys are strange, but it's good luck. <laughs> oh, so, you have to Thank you. So, Nicole is uh, a biblical counselor. She also has a master's in uh, pastoral ministry. And uh, she teaches a couple of classes here. Um, one of them we co-teach is Sexuality in Scripture, where we deal with the biblical perspective on sexuality. For some reason, that class is always full. <laughs> <laughs> and then the second one is an introduction to biblical counseling and conflict resolution. So uh, at the, we also have a Master of Ministry. We are the only uh, Adventist university that I know of that has a graduate program in biblical counseling. So uh, I'm thrilled to have her with us. She introduced me to a whole new world of what biblical counseling is, and she's drawing some of those principles from tonight about how we reach our heart. Now last time I taught at Summer Salt Lake, they gave me four hours, and I thought what I'm presenting today, which is taken from that, it's so important you guys would mind if we went, you know, three hours. I think you're going to have a problem with uh, not only reaching the heart, but reaching the rear end. <laughs>
want you to remember, people are always trying to fill up the God-shaped hole in their hearts with stuff. With money, with popularity, with movies, with food, with music, with accomplishments. None of it works because it's not shaped right. We have a craving for God that will never be satisfied because God has to make our idols crumble to bring him, us back to himself. This is why you want to find whatever they're actually craving. Whatever rules the heart will exercise inescapable influence over the person's life and behavior. Have you ever tried to counsel somebody in a codependent relationship? Oh, yeah. Super fun, isn't it? <laughs> they call you up, I just hate him, I can't stand being with him one more day. Awesome, why don't you break it off? Well, I would, except. <laughs> or, or maybe you get farther with them, and they actually break it off. They're like, you are so right. What a jerk. What happens in the next two weeks? <laughs> Back they go, right? Or they find some worse loser. You just can't win. Why? Because what's ruling their heart is not actually love for that person. They'll tell you. I remember somebody in one of those relationships telling you, you just don't understand true love like I do. Mm -hmm. That's why you're staying with him. Okay. <laughs> but did she really love him? No. No, she loved the way he made her feel. When you can figure out what this person is trying to get out of the other person, or the, the job, the wealth, the whatever, then you can figure out what's going on in their hearts. Because sin is much more than doing the wrong thing. It begins with loving, worshiping, and what? Serving, Serving the wrong thing. Sin is idolatry. All idolatry is sin. All sin is idolatry. We think God is not going to satisfy me as well as that thing does, and so we turn to that thing. And whatever that thing is, it will always be an idol. That's why we have to get to the root. If you understand the roots of your trouble, you can experience change that will last. How many of you have ever gardened? Anybody a gardener here? I just hauled my children out today, the ones that were willing, and we worked in the garden for a little while. And I actually came across a dandelion, and I was like, come on, God. I didn't have a shovel with me. I was like, forget it. I'll come back and get that thing later. Because what happens with dandelions? How many of you ever tried to get a dandelion out? Can't pull it, it'll break. Yes, it's an exercise in futility, right? Mm -hmm. To get the dandelion out, you have to have something sharp. You have to dig down because of what? Lord. It's that tap root that kills you with the dandelion. Mm. Idolatry has a tap root. Mm. And when you keep pulling off the leaves, you just waste your time, right? Mm. This is how addiction works. Because addiction is idolatry, is sin, and they all are kind of interchangeable. With an idol, if you just pull off the symptoms, you get nowhere, right? This is what happens when you're dealing with your classic porn addict, right? They're like, I know, I gotta stop, right? So what do they what do they try? Well, I'm gonna put filters on my phone and on my technology. Okay, that's not wicked, is it? No, I'm gonna get an accountability partner and start going to a group. Those are all good things to do, actually, excellent things to do. But if we haven't gotten to that root, they're going to find a way. They're going to get some unsupervised technology. They're going to fantasize. You can't stop an addict except if you get to the root. Now, those behaviors can still be useful because how do you find where the dandelion is? If I went out to my garden and somebody told me there's a dandelion out there, but you're going to have to find it. Am I going to dig up the entire garden looking for it? No, what am I going to look for? In the I'm going to look for those yellow flowers. <clears throat> or if the flower isn't there yet, I'm going to look for the leaves. I'm going to look for dandelion leaves. Addiction has leaves, and if you follow that leaf, that behavior, down to the root, you'll find what's at the bottom. With that codependent relationship, for example, I might ask the person who can't break it off with this person or keeps going back, what is it that you missed? about her when you were away? What is it you love most about this relationship? What is it that drew you to this relationship? What might be some answers to that? To those questions? Uh, the way she looked. Okay, she was so beautiful. Okay, so what, you felt good with her on your arm? Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Right, I felt attractive because I had an attractive person with me and I could show 
people. Look, this person who obviously is quality because they're so good looking found me attractive. All they could have had a lot of other people. Now you're getting too rude. Yes. All the way down. Or maybe it's he seems so stable. Or she listened to me. She was the first person who made me feel really loved. Now we know. Now this person has just given us the key to the lock for their heart. What is it that they're craving from God? Love. The longing. Somebody who they can depend on. Somebody who made them feel like they were worth a million bucks. Now you know what they're looking for. Follow the leaf down to the root. Ask the person good questions. And this is where when you ask good questions, you'll find out what the root is. When you ask that person, for example, what is it that you were feeling when you went to the fridge and binged on all that food? And they're like, I just felt so lonely. I just felt like, you know, I started thinking about my ex and how my ex is so happy now and I'm probably never going to find anybody. And I just, okay, now what have they told me? They're craving with a relationship with God. They want intimacy, right? They want deep connection. They're wondering whether they're worth anything. And this is how you follow the leaf down to the root. Because what happens if I take that shovel back to my garden tomorrow, which I intend to, and actually go down and get that dandelion out and I throw it on the driveway? What's going to happen to those leaves? <coughs> will they? That's right. That dandelion will be gone because I got to the root. Here's the tragedy of what we do in evangelism often. We tick off the list. Hmm. Okay, so are you drinking? Nope, I stopped that. Are you smoking anymore? Nope, I quit that. Awesome. And we dunk them. And they just switch from drinking and smoking as their escapes to movies and food. Have we fixed anything here? They may live a little longer, but are they going to be any closer to God? No, because next time they're down, they're going to open the fridge. And instead of getting out of beer, they're going to get out of burger. And they're mm -hmm. doing the same thing. They're going to something else instead of Christ as an idol. So we want to help people go to what God can do to that. And in order to come to that point, they're going to have to realize that God is more satisfying to them than the burger. God is more satisfying to them than their social media. <laughs> and that's when the root dries up and the person goes, wow, God is so much better than I thought. That's when they'll never leave him. Mm -hmm. That's when we fall in love. So we have to get to the root. The devil's most effective lies are those that take root most deeply in the heart. Find out what someone worships. What word is that? Worships. Worships, and you will find a path to their heart. We are created worshipers. We can't help it. We all worship. We don't decide whether or not to worship. We just decide what or who we will worship. And always at its root, it's choosing, do I worship God, or do I worship who? Satan. Satan. Or, Satan. or self. Or self. Right? Satan and self. If I'm choosing to worship self, I'm choosing to worship Satan. I'm always either eating from that tree where Eve went, oh, yeah, that would satisfy me more than God. Or I'm choosing to turn away and eat from the tree of life. Those are our two choices. We'll worship God, or we will worship someone or something else. And whatever that thing is, it will always be some form of selfishness. It will always be some form of unbelief and pride, these two root sins. When I don't believe that God is going to satisfy me, I'm going to, in pride, think I can find something that will satisfy me better than God. <coughs> unbelief and pride are always a cycle at the heart of every sin. Every sin you, you look up in the Bible, I challenge you. We'll never find any sin in the Bible that does not start with a cycle of unbelief and pride. You will never find sin in your own life that doesn't start with that cycle of unbelief and pride. Often people keep going around and around in circles in their addictive cycles, moving from music to movies to food to sex to relationships to ministry to whatever it is that makes them feel good in the moment instead of coming to Christ for satisfaction. And the real problem is always that they haven't allowed themselves to have faith and humility. So we can repent. I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry I went and binged on that whole tub of ice cream. It's okay to repent for the thing we did. I'm sorry I binged 
on that porn. I'm sorry I went and uh, slept with that person I shouldn't have slept with. I'm sorry I went and took some drugs. You know, we can, we'll work with people through some hard things. But those things they do are not really the issue. Those are the fruits of the issue. So when a person says, God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I did this thing. <laughs> Often, as we uproot the oak tree of that fall into watching pornography, we plant the acorn for the next fall by saying, oh God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. We basically whip ourselves like Martin Luther, thinking, well, the blood of Jesus isn't enough to cover me, but good news, Satan came to make his gospel and said, my blood can supplement. And the person who whips themselves, punishing themselves, essentially has paved the way for their next fall because next time we're tempted, we'll do the same thing again. We'll be like, okay, I'll fast three days next time. Back we go, right? The devil is just waiting until the right time to tempt us again, and we will fall if we think we can satisfy God's demands by our own good works. So here, that, that, was, that was a one-hour seminar on addiction. You're welcome. <laughs> Head for the oasis. But this is the struggle that everybody goes through every day. 
And in our culture, it's only intensifying all the time. We're a microwave world. We're a push a button and it's there world. And so people want the now. They don't want to wait for the oasis. But you know, the longer you, you sit there drinking that salt water, the farther away the oasis feels. And this is where, when you go and knock on somebody's door, chances are that's where they are spiritually. The oasis feels far away. And they won't say, my oasis feels far away. What, what are they going to say? It'll sound more like, yeah, I know I ought to get back to God. I've been thinking about that. I should get to church. I've been thinking I should study the Bible. What are they saying? They're saying the oasis feels far away. So you know they've been digging down and getting some salt water. Now you need to know the symptoms of what's going on in their lives, and you can follow those down to the root. Oh, yeah? So when you do have some time, what do you usually do? Uh, nothing much, really. Just kind of sit here at home and get a pizza and watch TV. Okay, so they're escaping the pleasure because they don't believe that God is going to give them that much pleasure if they go to him, right? The oasis feels too far away. So how do you reach them? Sometimes the best thing to do is that quick feel, felt, sound. I understand how you feel. I felt that way too. Here's what I found. Right? I understand. Yeah, you know, I've been through some really rough times. There was a time that I really went through a deep depression after I went through a breakup. And I felt like God was so far away. Why do I say that? Because that's where I'm guessing they are. And then... I started reading my Bible. I decided I was going to stop just going to stuff that wasn't really satisfying me. And this little book right here really helped me, Steps to Christ. You know, so you find a way you can connect with them. I understand how you feel, at least to some degree. They say, oh, my mother just died. Oh, yeah, I understand how you feel. No, no, you don't. But, but you can come alongside a person and make a good guess at what they're feeling. When they say, yeah, I've been thinking I really ought to read the Bible, but it's just kind of... Okay, so what they just told me is the Holy Spirit's convicting me that I need to read the Bible, and now God has sent me, you know, you to their door to help them, hopefully, to sense their need for God's presence more. So what you want to do is encourage people to head to the oasis by saying, hey, it's not that far to the oasis. Come on, I'll help you. Here's some water. Let me bring you some water. Right? You say, here's a Bible promise that really helped me when I was going through a time that I felt like God was far away. Bring him some living water. Suggest to them, maybe read the book of John. That's a really easy one to get into. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to come back next week and study the Bible with you. I've been going through some really interesting studies myself. It's helping me to grow closer to God. I would love to share with you. What do you think? See how easy it is? I understand how you feel. I felt that way too. Here's what I found. Sometimes will help you to just kind of build a bridge when you tell a person a story from your own experience, like my husband was sharing. Mm -hmm. What are people longing for? This is what we know about every human being. Every one of us in this room, every person walking past you in the grocery store, we all have these two great longings. What are they? Let's say them together. Love and words. Love and work. Some books will call it um, security and significance. Same song, different verse. It's the same thing. We, we are craving love and work. We long for connection because we are created in the image of a relational God, right? God is love. And love is a relational word. And God is a relational God. And he made us in his image as relational beings, right? So there's nothing wrong with craving love. The problem is we keep looking to all these idols either to make us feel loved or to help us escape from the craving for love. Same thing with worse. We want to know that we make a difference in the world. We want to know that somebody cares we're here, that the world is a better place because we're here. And when we don't have that sense, we get depressed, don't we? We start scrabbling to try to do something. We lie awake at night thinking, well, what is there that I do or that I am that is of value? We crave love and work. And God wants to give us that sense of love and work in him. Ellen White says, the glory of God is to be revealed in the creation of man in God's image and in his redemption. What are the two things that are the measure 
of how much we are loved and how much we are worth here. What two things uh, show how much we're worth? Okay, we're created in God's image and, and redeemed by his blood. These are the two things that show how much we are loved and how much we are worth. So you can always walk people back to these. These themes are woven throughout the stories of scripture. How much we are loved, how much we are worth, are measured by the fact that we were created in the image of God. He breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. He stood us up on our feet and said, you are my creation. And the moment I created you, I loved you more than the whole universe because I was willing to give up ruling the whole universe to be with you. But what did we do? We spit in his face and said, I don't need you. I'll find something better. And we walk away from him, don't we? And this is the story of every sinner. But what does Jesus do when we walk away? He goes after us. He follows after us and he says, I will die for you. And that is redemption. So that's something simple you can tell a person who tells you what they're craving. You say, well, you were created in the image of God. He loves you with an everlasting love. The moment that he made you in his image as a relational being, he said, oh, I love you so much. You can never possibly imagine how much I love you. Now, the key is we have to help people to be able to internalize that message of love. Sometimes the best thing that you will do in counseling somebody is not a word that you say. It's the look on your face as you show that you care, as they tell you about the abuse they've gone through, as they share with you the pain that they've gone through in that breakup or the loss of someone they love. And they see in your face the love of Jesus. That kindles in them a belief, even if they're not conscious of it yet, that maybe they are loved, maybe they are valuable. And the Jesus you tell them about after they see that in you is a Jesus they will want to hear about. So the look on your face, the tone of your voice, you may preach a sermon to a person who says, look, I just want you to know up front, I'm a militant atheist, I'm not going to have anything to do with your God thing. Okay, tell me your story. And you don't have to say the name of Jesus to shine the love of Jesus from your face. So God wants us to reflect how much people are loved and how much they are worth. Now we have to be careful as Bible workers or whatever we're doing, as friends, as people who are trying to have intentionally helpful conversations, and this would be another whole hour of uh, class, so here's your two second version of the, the one hour class on boundaries. You take the hand of Christ, you take their hand and you bring them together, and then you step back. And then they're going to go, oh, I just, I don't know, I feel so bad today, I don't know what's going on, they just say, I... okay, you, let me share with you a Bible promise that's really helped me. Here it is, I am going to pray for you today. And I'll be here if you want to go for a walk at 7.30 tomorrow morning, right? Because you wanted to get to bed tonight, not at 2 a.m. So I'll be, oh, I just watched it in a movie. <laughs> right? So you can, you can be guarded and guided in how you interact with them. Take their hand, take the hand of Christ, bring them together. But don't be an elevator. Be a crutch, helping them until they can get on their feet. But when you get to be an elevator and they're like, Oh, I just want to come over to your house tonight and sit down at 11 o'clock at night and sob for two hours. No, that's not going to work, right? So take their hand, take the hand of Christ, bring them together. You're going to need good boundaries because people who have been falling onto idols one after another for years are sometimes going to easily latch onto you as the next idol. Oh, you will make me feel loved. Actually, I don't need that Jesus thing because I can talk to you about my problems. And that's what you don't want. You then get in the way so that they, you can prevent them from coming to Christ. It feels good. It's, it's heady stuff when somebody's telling you, oh, you're just the most Christ-like person I've ever seen in my life. I don't know what I would do without you. We can be kind of intoxicated with that ministry. And, wow, he's such a Christian. This ministry thing is just so getting me pumped. But then when they are calling you all the time for everything, you're going to get drained. So, there you go. That was another hour and a half, right? We're, we're just the sore. And we let Christ do the harvesting and the Holy Spirit. The growing. So. That's right. You are a straw. You notice how I'm using words?
word pictures. That's another whole class that I won't get to you right now. But use word pictures because there you will stick images in their mind. You are like a straw. Have you ever had a straw that is supposed to be disposable, but you try to use it again, but it's gonna like got a clump of smoothie in it or something? <laughs>
we deal with that core problem that they believe that's going to satisfy the more we use it, they're going to keep going back. So help them to realize God is who he says he is in his word, not who you might feel he is, not who your life circumstances, that abusive background you had or whatever, not who those things tell you he is. He is who he says he is. You can depend on it. As we help people transfer over to believing God is who he says he is in his word instead of God is who I feel he is, you will see change happen in their lives. The addictions will fall off. The stuff that they were doing that they shouldn't be doing will slip away. And then my computer doesn't like me. There we go. Okay. How much are you loved? Bring people back to the cross. He loves them. And as we love them, as we convince them that he loves them, they will naturally be able to love him. It's no use trying to say, I'm going to love God, I'm going to love God, I'm going to love God, when you believe that God is this torturous, horrible being who would save your grandma from burning for thousands of years in purgatory if only you'd pay some money, but you don't have that money. Like, how are you supposed to love a God like that? Um, I know I've, I've met many wonderful people when I was going out door to door who have a relationship with God, even though they have a horrifying theology. God needs people where they are. But the better they come to understand that God is a God of love, the easier it is for them to love him in response. And that's the law of God, right? Love God first, love your neighbor as yourself. That's where the battle lies. So you're going to help people to realize where they're turning when they come to a difficult time. This is this lie on the road is trial. It's a struggle. It's what God says, but I feel. And they have to decide where they're going to turn. Are they going to turn to Christ? Are they going to open their Bible? Or are they going to open their computer and go on social media? Or their, you know, order a pizza? Or whatever it is that they're going to do. Because that's the moment when they find out. That's the moment when all of us find out. Do I really believe that God satisfies me better than ice cream? Well, ice cream is wonderful stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying it's a sin to eat some ice cream, but it's the why, right? It doesn't have to be bad things that we're doing. Anybody here ever clean your house compulsively when you're stressed? <laughs> right, because now there's nothing sinful about cleaning your house, right? But what happens if I clean my house compulsively because I'm stressed and one of my kids walks into the room that I just swept and drops their muddy shoes? What do I do? Yeah. Yeah. Why are you doing that, right? I was getting my sense of worth out of that room being clean, and you wrecked it. So the first thing to do is to go to Christ and say, I am struggling right now. I'm feeling like I'm not loved. I'm feeling like I'm not worth something, and I'm wanting to clean my house from a place of emptiness. Will you please fill me so that I can clean from a place of fullness? Nothing wrong with cleaning your house. It's not the what you're doing. It's the why. And the why is where God wants us to put our focus. What is driving our heart? What is the root? How do we overcome idolatry, which is another word for addiction, which is another word for sin? Focusing on Christ instead of self is the foundation of our identity, our worth, and lovability. When we find God is who he says he is and he loves me that much, that dandelion is lying in the, in the driveway, withering in the hot sun. And I'm coming back to Jesus and saying, I'd like some more of that in my life. So how do we do that? When we're struggling, we can meditate on who God is, so our self-focus is lost in his majesty and love. Um, hmm. So when a person... Uh, anything to share with you? <laughs> <laughs> when a person is struggling with doubt, discouragement, guilt. Okay, so when, let's say, let's say you're dealing with somebody who just went and binged on porn, and they call you up and say, I just did it, I fell again, I hate myself so much, you know how this goes, right? Okay, have you prayed, have you confessed? Yes, I felt so bad, I went in my room, and I knelt down beside my bed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I confessed, and I told God how rotten I am, and how much I hate myself, and I always hate myself when I do this, and I don't know what to do. I don't know why I keep going back to this stuff. I hate it. I hate myself. You know, are you seeing a pattern here? It was guilt. 
that drove them to their knees beside their bed. It was built as a message from God saying, hey, you sinned. You did something that's standing between you and me. Come away to me. Let me satisfy your heart. So that's guilt. Guilt is a good thing. Guilt is a message from God calling people to himself. But when I stand up for my knees and I still feel rotten, that's not guilt anymore. That's not God saying you haven't repented yet. Sometimes we do need to not just say, I'm sorry I did this thing, watch this movie. We need to say, God, I'm sorry for the unbelief that led me to neglect quality time with you for the last few days. That led me to, when I was at work, think, ah, I can't wait to get home and watch that trash. I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't. But, you know, that, that cycle that we were playing with, and I just I saw that commercial, and now I can't think of anything but pizza. And I know I shouldn't be eating pizza. But, it, you know what I see? We've all been down that road, right? In one form or another. So when you're counseling the drug addicts, they're doing the same thing that you did when you were knowing you shouldn't eat that pizza. Same song. So when they stand up from their knees and say, I still feel terrible, that's the time to praise God. Thank him that he met you there, that he knew you were going to do this when he carried this sin to the cross ahead of time. And I want to say it's a Every day, it's every day thing. You have to pray about it and ask God to take it away. Yeah. Every day, every second of the day, you're praying all the time. Right, we got to put our hearts out it. there as we go to the cross. Yeah. Surrender, surrender them to the chains that easily bind. All the time. And then, it's, it's when we start being self confident. Yeah, I actually, I've had victory now for three weeks and four days. I'm good, you know. And then the devil goes, oh. Yeah, right? Yeah. So, what are broken cisterns? Anyone or anything you turn to instead of Christ for love or worth is an idol. It's a broken cistern. And steadfast pursuit of idols will always turn into an addiction. We will just switch like a bee going from flower to flower. We'll go from this thing to this thing to this thing, but it's all really the same thing. Something else will satisfy me because I don't believe Jesus will satisfy me until this thing. Now, I want to caution all of us. Remember, healing is a process, not just an event. Now, many people, I'm sure people in here could testify, you know, I was smoking up until this day, and I prayed, and God broke the chains, and I never looked back, and I've never wanted to smoke a cigarette. So most of us find that victory is a process, right? And I love this verse. He heals the brokenhearted and does what? Binds up their wounds. You know that sounds like a process, doesn't it? It's not just an event. And I like to think of how Jesus, instead of just walking into the room when I've got two broken legs and touching me and I'm healed, wow, this is wonderful. A year later, I'd be like, oh, yeah, Jesus came in my room and healed my broken legs. But instead, Jesus usually comes in and sits beside me and reads to me. He usually comes and talks to me about my day. He doesn't just take away the pain. He draws close to us in the pain. Most of the time, we're going to draw closest to Jesus when we're hurting, not when everything is going great. So instead of him taking away the pain and helping us feel fantastic whenever we come to him in prayer, Lord, take this. Wow, I feel great. Instead, he walks with us in the journey. And we'll find that we heal best, not when we have instantaneous victory over everything the moment we pray, but when we have to keep coming to him daily, pleading for victory, just like what you're saying. Now, I will finish here with, let me give you a quick word picture. Okay, parable of the sower. We're just going to go through one little part of the parable of the sower. You know this story. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed some fell by the wayside, it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. I like one translation that says, fell by a footpath. A footpath is beaten down by other people's feet, right? Sometimes the people you're dealing with, their ability to trust God and let him into their heart has been beaten down by somebody else's choices. Abuse they've gone through, neglect they've gone through, rejection, bullying, hurt. And so their ground is hard, but maybe not fully 
through their own choices. And Jesus deals tenderly with us when we're dealing with the pain of going through bullying or problems, <coughs> abuse. But the sower, we know from what Jesus said, who is the sower? Well, Christ is. He sows through us. Right? So the sower is God, and he sows what? The sower sows the seed, and the seed is the word of God. The word of God, yes. So there's no problem with the sower here, is there? And there's no problem with the seed. The problem is where? The soil. It's with the soil. So when I've got a problem and I need to get God's word to take root in my heart, what am I going to do? The sower sows the word. If I want to make a garden out of a hard footpath, what am I going to do to that ground? Cultivate. I'm going to cultivate it. What am I going to cultivate it with? Let's assume right. that the Holy Spirit has already come and watered it. What do I need to do now to get into the dirt? Wow. Rototiller, okay. If I don't have a rototiller, what else could I use? Well, we're, we're trying to get through the hard soil here. A hoe, okay. What else could I use? A shovel. What do all these tools have in common? Sharp edges. So I need a sharp edge to get into that soil. So let's say again, what's the sharpest thing in the world? The word. the word of God. So in my devotional time, I'm going to take the word and I'm going to do this on that hard ground of my heart, right? Is that is that how you get through hard soil? No. 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 Let me tell you, when I, when I talk to people, I'll often ask them, so are you spending time with God? Are you talking devotions? And they'll say, oh yeah, I have a devotion every day. What do they mean by that? Right. They spent two minutes reading a little page or a chapter, or they had a friend, please be with grandma and help me to do well on whatever at work today, right? So they're doing this. Now, if I do this long enough with the word, it'll do something. But that's not the way the word is designed to work, is it? How am I supposed to relate? Here, study. Okay, I've got to turn it this way, right? You will find your devotional life will have power as you point the word at the actual stuff going on in your life. So, Lord, I am not getting along with this person at work. Lord, my husband, bless his heart, has some issues I'd love for you to <laughs> My children are not fully sanctified yet, Lord, right? So when we point the sword at what's actually going on in our hearts, of course, the husband, the husband is never an actual problem, right? It's my heart that needs to work. Not that he doesn't have some room to grow, but... <laughs> <laughs> so point the sword at what's actually going on in your life. Lord, I'm undisciplined. Lord, I keep struggling with going back to this thing or that thing whenever I know I should come to you instead. Point the sword at the actual thing going on in your life, and that's when you'll see action happen. Now, you don't just tap either, right? What do we do if we want to get through the ground? we got to put some force behind it, right? Meditate on the word. Don't just claim a quick promise. Lord, you will keep them in perfect peace. His mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I'm going to trust you today. I'm not going to get stressed at work, right? And that works until you make it to the door, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I had a friend who used to write Bible verses and put them in his shoe because he was grappling with temptation. And he was like, I'm going to overcome. I'm going to overcome. I'm going to stand on the word. I'm going to keep it. <laughs> you may want to write that Bible verse on the palm of your hand. Don't be anxious about anything, right? Put it on a post-it note on your, on your series deal, whatever it is. Meditate on those scripture songs, but drink it in. Put some force behind it. Pray earnestly, not a quick two-minute thing. Earnestly seek the Lord. Drink in what he says about what he thinks about you, and you'll find your workaholism withers up. You find in him the sense of how much you're loved, and that craving to go on dating sites dries up. That's what God wants us to do. So put some force behind it, point straight at the struggle that's going on in your heart, and you will see God do great things 
in your life. And this is a simple allegory you can use with anybody that you're studying with. Say, what is it you're struggling with? Point it at what they're going through. Now, we don't have time to go through this, but I thought some of you might want to be able to take a picture of it. But this is a way that you can walk people through identifying what are the specific broken cisterns that they're struggling with. And this is something you can do in your own devotional time, too. And that makes it even better to say, you know, here's the process I've been going through in my devotional time because I was kind of going through a dry time. Where do you turn when you feel down? What is it that you're turning to? And you will know what it is. Follow that leaf down and you'll find the root. Lord, I'm lonely. And then I want to do this. What underlying thirst does that idol seem to satisfy? What will relying on God's ability to satisfy the thirst of your heart look like practically? And are you willing to choose to trust God in this struggle? And if not, why not? This is a simple process you can walk people through to see how they can grow closer to the Lord. All right. Thank you. Yes, question. Okay, seriously. Write, write this down. This book called Practicing His Presence. Practicing His Presence. By yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Lawrence. Excellent. Like every, it's ancient, but it's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. breath you take, yeah. every bite of food you take, every beat of your heart, heart Practicing you are in adoration of God. Practicing His Presence. The book is excellent. I bet I've read it ten times. Yes, excellent. Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence. The L A W R E N. Yes. 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 Check in. It's on Amazon. It's on Sometimes a, you may not even be able to really have a meaningful, like, long-term relationship with somebody. You sit with them on a plane, they're gone, but you can suggest to them good resources, steps to Christ, practicing His presence. John 15, whatever it is, give people a little more of something that they can do on their own to connect them Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. presence and the blood of Jesus and so we pray that you will help us to to sense other people's needs uh, to meet those needs not in our own strength but by uniting them with the power and with the love of Jesus thank you for this and thank you for this great crowd tonight continue to be with us for we ask it in Jesus name Lisa Parks, uh, Tammy Bell, and Maria Frank Poise, if you could just come and see Twitter.